Welcome to Deep Look, Ulti World's weekly radio show about the current state of Ultimate. I'm the host and the editor of Ulti World, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me, Ulti World senior editor Keith Rayner, and we've got John Randolph from Brown University, captain at Brown, coming to join us today, and he'll be talking a little bit about their win at Easterns as they sweep the season. They only have one loss on the year. It's their first game of the year, but they go on to win Florida warm-up. They win the Smoky Mountain Invite, and then they close it off with a win at Easterns, and they head into a postseason where they have to get through the gauntlet of New England regionals just to get back to nationals. So we'll talk with JR a little bit later on in the show. We're also going to take a little bit of a closer look at the USA national team that was just selected last week uh, as we kind of start to take a look at how is this team going to put it together, its lines, what what kind of offensive and defensive structures might we see from them and dig a little bit deeper into that. We're also going to recap the college season because it starts this weekend, the postseason series, conferences. So good luck to those of you who are competing. It's unbelievable, isn't it, Keith? It happens so fast. Every year it happens fast, but this year it felt like extra fast. Very, very fast. So a uh, ton to get to and, and a bunch of news that we'll get to in small ball. But first, we've got to hear from Khalif El Salam. We've got to. Who, got to. You have to. He went on his Instagram and he responded to our show last week. And uh, he's got a 30 minute video up over on his Instagram and kind of goes through point by point the beginning of the show that we had last week when we were talking about the World Games team. And so uh, we're going to play a seg- section, of, uh, a couple sections from it for you here and hear from Khalif uh, about our show last week. Listen. <clears throat> All right. I got freaking 30 minutes to <clears throat> rebut this deep look thing, man. The only reason why I'm doing this is because the slander is disrespectful. The slander is disrespectful. It's not accurate. But when I make a World Games team and you spend <clears throat> two minutes and 13 seconds ragging on me, but t- talking good about everybody else on the team, when when I got the accolades and the skill that I have, nah, bro, nah. You're at least gonna you're at least gonna back up with your thoughts with facts, figures, and numbers. But out of all those people who made the team for the first time this year, you were like, most of those people. I'll say it. Most of those people weren't even locks for you. They weren't even locks. There are some people who made the World Games team who are not locks for you. But they're not surprising. If there is anyone who had to be surprising, it's the four-time world champion, Khalifa Salam. Okay. If I spent my entire career, you've watched me spend my entire career to get to the epitome of mixed ultimate, which is this, and I make the team, how is that shocking for you? But I'm at tryouts. To anyone who went to tryouts can attest to this. I'm at tryouts locking those people up. What are you talking about? It's like, yes, they're absolutely phenomenal players. They're able to win their 1v1s, get open, make their great decisions, stuff like that. But I'm here with them. I can, I, I'm there with them. I'm in the same group, skill, athleticism, impact. I'm right in that exact same group. Why are you saying that I'm not? Why don't you believe that I am? How long have you been following Chris Kotcher's career? You've been following Dylan's career. You've been dry humping Dylan's career, his whole career. Same with Jimmy Mickle. These same three players are the ones who are in my DMs being like, Khalif, I'm so excited to play with you. World Games is going to be phenomenal. But you think for some reason there's this really big, this really big gap, bro. It does not make any sense to me. You have commentated my games, quarters, semis at nationals. So you've seen me play at the highest, highest level, right? You see me play at the highest, highest level. And even if you weren't commenting on the games that I'm participating in, you've seen me play in four world finals if you've been watching me. And have you been watching me in those games where I'm low-key unstoppable? Are you even looking is what is what my question is. You cannot tell me that you think that me being excited and, and expressing myself on my social media platforms has anything to do with me making the team. It does not have anything to do with me making the team. You're telling me that Miranda, Patrick, and Maddie are going on my Twitter handle 
or going on my Instagram and seeing that I'm nervous or excited about tryouts or showcasing what tryouts looks like and be like, we have to take this person on the team because they tweeted about us. We have to take this person on the team because they're putting tryouts on their Instagram. My goals for Instagramming tryouts, which you watch, which you watch because you don't get to go. You watch my Instagram stories was to give people insight onto what the highest level tryout looks like. Well, it was an excellent rebuttal, Keith. And uh, I, I, I love I love that Khalif was willing to sit down and put together notes and make a video about the, you know, our, our show and what we had to say. Uh, you know, I, I, I definitely, this is not going to be like some kind of clap back type situation <laughs> that I, I think maybe some people would be hoping for. I saw, uh, I saw I, somebody suggest we were manufacturing beef, Charlie. No, no, no. <laughs> I, and I don't want beef with Khalif. Uh, I really like Khalif. And uh, I have a few sh- thoughts to share here uh, about what he had to say. And, you know, he makes some great points in the video. You know, some of the stuff that we didn't include in this uh, that, you know, he, has, he only had one recorded uh, turnover at the national championships in last fall in October. He's made all of the uh, world's teams that he's tried out for and obviously has been an incredibly successful player by any metric by which you measure success in ultimate Frisbee. There's no doubt about it. Um, so, so a couple notes, you know, when we're talking about the world's game team, the, what, what we're, we're measuring gradations of greatness, right? Literally the first criteria for even getting a tryout is that you made the most recent USA national team for the world championships. So like that's the, that's the player pool. And then they give a couple of exemptions to people who were either hurt or had a great season or something like that. But basically what you're looking at for the tryouts themselves is the greatest players in the country. And to then make the second tryout, like what we're talking about is the elite of the elite. So, Khalif took strong exception to something that I said, which is that, you know, he hasn't proven it at the highest level. That doesn't mean that he hasn't gone and won national championships or world titles like that. To be fair, like I should have made that clear. But the, the everybody in this group is an incredibly successful and talented ultimate player. And really, you could throw darts and pick a great team from the full tryout pool, let alone the second tryout pool. So I want to make sure that it's really super clear. I think Khalif is a, is a tremendous player, as are all of the candidates for trying to make this final 14. Um, so, you know, I, I think if you, if Khalif asked for stats and, and figures, and, you know, if you're going to say that uh, I'm a surprise, you got you to gotta back it up with, with, the, with the math. I, um, I, I, boy, do I wish that we could, I really wish <laughs> that we had a lot more data than we do. Uh, it's unfortunate that we're so limited in that. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, at the end of the day, like a lot of, uh, analyzing players and such comes down to gut, gut feel. Like we have some stats at nationals, but even that's been spotty lately. Um, I, I think, I don't really, I'm not super interested in like getting down into the nitpicky details because at the end of the day, basically what there's, there were 15 or 16 male matching players who came to the second tryout and then it gets cut down to seven. Yes. For me, I stand by what I said. I think it's a surprise that Khalif was one of the seven that said, like, obviously the guy has been working towards this moment and like trying out for this team for multiple seasons, like years of time. And like, you can see that from social media, like the training, the effort that's been put into it. And so I don't want to take anything away from all of that hard work. And in fact, somebody who was at the tryout, uh, the the first weekend of tryout said that Khalif was the most impressive player on the male matching side at the tryout. So there you go, right? Like if you show up and you play that kind of defense and you prove it in the biggest spot, in the biggest tryout, and you have to do it twice, right? You don't luck into that. You deserve a spot. It's that simple. And I just think my priors coming in were that, you know, 
he was not somebody that I was going to put on the, the short list of people that I expected to make the team. And we got some of those wrong. I mean, he even talks about like some of the players we didn't have uh, as locks that made the team. Yeah, no doubt. Like some of the people I said were locks didn't even make the the team. We, now, we definitely even, in some cases didn't misses. even make the second tryout key. We definitely had misses. Uh, maybe more than maybe more than like I feel like we usually do when we go through these kinds of processes. Like, yeah, I feel like in general we're pretty accurate at picking stuff on the show. But I feel like we missed some missed some big ones here, and uh, I, I think we were pretty surprised in total by the selections and and those who weren't selected. Uh, but not because we don't think that the players who made it deserved it. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't think I think it's more of a reflection of us saying like we were surprised because we didn't expect that result. Like we didn't know that that was what was going to happen. Not we don't think that shouldn't have happened. I, I don't I don't think either of us begrudge the coaches or feel like they made a mistake or feel like Khalif doesn't deserve to be on the team or anything like that. Uh, you know, we, we have, we have certainly got on a limb and said like how good we thought Khalif is in various points in our, in our ultra world careers. I, you know, we both had him in our top 10 for our mixed player rankings that we did it in 2020. Like we both yeah. voted for him for awards and stuff Locked. like that. Uh, you know, that it's, it's, I, I think that part of our mistake here was, uh, not showing enough love, but also kind of assuming that, you know, the, that it was just understood. Oh, we're talking about world games players. Like everybody knows they're really good. And not that Khalif needs us to tell him he's really good. You know, in fact, I was, I was listening to his, his video and my wife was nearby. She was like, wow, he sounds really confident. And I was like, you know, I kind of feel like that's one of Khalif's superpowers. Like, and it has, it's not even just now that he's done the accomplishments that he listed in the video that he's, you know, won all the world titles or whatnot, uh, that he, is a confident player. Five years ago, he walks on the line, and this is really important when, especially when you're a, a D line player, like he's been for much of his career. He walks on the line, and it doesn't matter who he matches up against. He's confident I can win that matchup. Like I feel like that's one of Cleef's number one strengths is his confidence. Uh, and you know, we should have been a little more cognizant and, and recognizing of the fact that this is a great accomplishment for a player who's worked really hard and gone through a lot of challenges to get to where he is. Uh, so certainly, you know, congratulations to Cleef, and we should have been more congratulatory uh, in, our, in our initial thoughts. Uh, but I stand by my surprise. And I, I, I kind of feel like there's a lot of people out there who are also surprised but stand to gain nothing by saying they were surprised at this point. And there are a lot of people who are like, well, obviously Khalif made the team. I, I knew that. I knew that that was going to happen. Well, that's easy for everybody to say when you don't have to put your opinions out before the fact. You know, well, I, <laughs> I saw somebody look. tweet. I, I, I saw somebody tweet. Well, obviously they are going to take mixed players. Like that's such a, that it's obvious now that they're going to take mixed players. Well, what were they doing all the other years then? Did mix suck for the other years that we've had tryouts? No, I don't think so. Right. So it's not obvious that they were going to take mixed players. It should have been something that we were thinking about more because I, I think it was Caleb Denacor in our discord who brought up the fact that, and Khalif brought this up during his Instagram, during the, during the world games tryouts is the ability to play cross gender was something I think that probably stood out and really helped him make the team. Like he was like, I, I'm, I'm, I have not missed a cross gender shot at this tryout is basically what he said on Instagram. And like, that should have been something that should have been a key in my head. Like, Oh, this is, this is a great time for him. Uh, that's where I feel like I missed, you know what I mean? Sure. I mean, the, the, I, and I actually got a little correction in, uh, the world games article, uh, back in 2005, Scott Conway, was had had been playing primarily mixed uh, for the past few seasons, and he made the World Games team. That's basically the only instance that there's ever been a primar primarily mixed division player on the team, and it, I mean it hasn't happened in any time recently, right? So over 15 years, uh, and and now we get two in Sarah Mextroth and Khalif El Salam, who I think are clearly have been standard bearers for the division, and so. You know, if you're gonna make a short list of people who could make it out of the mixed division, you know, those were both top five players for me in our 2020 player rankings. Uh, it's no surprise to see them have success and make the team. That said, I do think because of the history of primarily single gender division players getting selected, and just like you look at the AUDL. Right. I don't know that I don't know that Khalif had the, the best AUDL 2021 season. 
like didn't showcase the the his top level abilities um and not that he was a bad player by any stretch but he wasn't one of the most dominant players on the San Diego Growlers that said you know obviously had a great club nationals and uh I I think Khalif has proven that he can be a tremendous defender and I I think focusing on his defense and like making that the emphasis that he came to tryouts with and then being able to also showcase the ability to do uh, to play really well in that mixed setting because of course he's been playing in the mixed division for what I don't even know how long now probably almost 10 years uh that's obviously going to set you apart in that setting so I, I think it's interesting to see the coaching staff uh you know pick mixed players for the first time like I feel like when these same tryouts happened four years ago, there were there were players in the mixed division at the time who I thought like were quite good, but you you were still seeing single gender only. So I mean, you let's though. let's what twelve of the twelve of the players are are players who primarily played in single gender divisions plus all of the alternates. So it's like this is still a pattern that exists now. Right. Like if you go through the trial list, how many players were invited to tryouts that have played primarily in the mixed division? Very few. Yeah, this it was, is not it was a small ancient minority. history. So, right. uh, you know, I, I think that that's something that we should keep an eye on. And it could speak to biases in how we evaluate players, how coaches evaluate players, how the invites are set out. I mean, I think that's what some of the players in the mixed division have been saying for a couple of years. Like, hey, the people need to take us seriously. And so this is a great chance for, for you know, people to celebrate players from the mixed division and to say, like, hey, we can hang. And I don't know that they've necessarily needed to prove that. We've certainly seen that from Mex and Khalif at various points in their career, as well as other players. But, uh, you know, we've seen the disparity on on paper with who's getting the invites and who's getting the selection. So uh, we'll see how that changes over the over the course of the year. But I, I certainly expect that to be something that helps them playing for this World Games team. That's for sure. Uh, Khalif won Defensive Player of the Year in 2018, uh, did not win any player awards or make an all-club team in either the 2019 or the 2021 I think, season. I think he was I think he was the first I looked at the voting totals and he was the first player off the D Podi podium in 2019. I want to say and not Makes sense. I think I think in 2019 he was the first player off the podium. But, you know, has long been a great defender. So, I I want to just say I apologize for not being more thoughtful about the way that we talked about Khalif and the rest of the team because honestly, last week we had just gotten the roster we sat down and we were focused on what surprised us and who we thought got snubbed. And so a lot of the conversation was really more about that than it was about like, let's actually take a look at the team, what its strengths are. And uh, I think that colored the conversation a little bit in, in, a, in a more sort of like scrutiny focused direction. But I think today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the team and say, OK, what are the strengths? How can this team get put together to win gold? As I mentioned last week, I think it's the heavy favorite to win, but I, I do have an update from what I said last week. Elizabeth Mosqueda, who had a knee injury uh, at the uh, PUL regional weekend last summer, is already back playing. So she's expected to play, and that is a huge, huge, huge deal for Columbia. And uh, <laughs> you don't you know, say. We, <laughs> we're we're going to talk about that. I mean, you know, I, I think that. She was playing, she was the, in my mind, the best player in the world starting about the end of 2019. And, you know, could, if, if she's fully healthy, could be the best player at the World Games. Like, that, that's a real possibility. So, uh, we, we will, we'll have a chance to look into that. This is, this is a, this is a, I guess, a marginal detail, but, uh, and, and a little bit of an update. Uh, our, our own, uh, Ravi Vasudevan, uh, updated us that it's a ratio rule a that'll be in use at the world games, which was they used at the last world games as well. So they'll alternate every two points for the gender ratios. Uh, but also they'll be using gender prescribed pulling, which I love just one of my favorite rule additions that we've made in, in the mixed vision over the past few years. Uh, Elizabeth Mosqueda is one of the best pullers in the world. So that's going to be a huge advantage. Period. For Period. Man or woman. Uh, uh, yeah, end she- of sentence. She is she is phenomenal. Um, so I figure let's let's go down and take a look at the players on the on the USA roster. Talk about some of their strengths uh, and how we might see this team get 
lined up. And I, I think we should start with Khalif since we've been, that's been the topic of the start of the show here. Um, Khalif, also a tremendous puller, great defender, I think versatile enough to play on a cutter or a handler and is going to be a weapon in transition as well. Because, you know, one of the things uh, in my um, article that I wrote, uh, Fundamentals of, of Throwing a Backhand, I used that. I used a picture of him throwing that backhand huck, the one that you, you you're thinking of right now, <laughs> full field at nationals, you know, comes out on a hyzer on inside out, bombs it to the back of the end zone, perfectly in stride of the receiver for an enormous score. I think it was in the final. I think it's I think it's semifinals. Was it semifinals against Dragon Thrust? Like I want to say I- iconic throw of the last ten years. Um, and so like obviously the the throwing ability and the power. Uh, particularly on the backhand side, could be a real advantage in transition. Um, so I, I expect to see Khalif out there on on D points on a regular basis. It, indeed. In fact, I think that's true for the other player that we mentioned as a surprise from the male matching players, which is Nate Goff. I think that you can pencil in Khalif and Nate Goff to be playing a lot of D lines. Now, I, I don't actually recall from the last World Games how strict we saw offense-defense players for this team, I mean, I we know that playing both ways is like a big factor in making the team. But there are some players who feel like, you know, you're going to see them mostly playing one way or the other. Like, I think it, it, while we're talking about the male matching players, that Jimmy Mickle, you can expect to see him on most offensive points and probably infrequently on defensive points. Uh, I think you'll probably see Jack Williams play mostly offensive points. Uh, but Goff and El Salam, I think, are, are kind of like the cornerstones of the male matching D-line for this team. Uh, because you have a, a great versatility. I talked to another coach uh, from the club men's division who was like, I think Nate Goff's the most versatile defender in the game right now. And wow. He is ex- way quicker, I think, than people realize. And it gives him the ability to match match with and overwhelm other throwers. Uh, but I think you'll probably see Goff, since, especially since the team lacks a lot of size elsewhere, I think you'll probably see Goff match up with the biggest aerial threat on the other team, the, the, the biggest problem in the air. Uh, and Khalif will probably get the assignment on the most important offensive male matching player on the other side, who's going to be initiating cut. I think that's probably where you'll see Khalif uh, put it put in into defend. What, what, who's going to be the the third and fourth defenders on the on the men's side? Well, I think there's some flexibility here, but to me, it feels like uh, Chris Kotcher and Grant Lindsley are the players you're most likely to see from the from the male matching side. Now, Grant's someone I, I would have said feels like an O-line guy. But yeah, he that's did, what I was going to say. He did have a really successful season as a part of the Pony D-line this past class. That is true. Uh, I was I was impressed. I mean, Grant's getting a little long in the tooth, right? But uh, he, did, he didn't look any worse for wear and, and held up defensively. It wasn't just like a post-turn quarterback kind of role. He was in critical defensive role for them. Uh I think that they probably want I, – I would think that they'll probably put Grant out there more defensively. I think there's something to preserving some of the Kotcher-Mickle chemistry that we've seen work so much magic over the years. But uh, I, I think that that's possible. But it could, it could go either way there. I mean, I, I, I imagine that you're going to see some rotation between a lot of these other players. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, even Jimmy Mickle, if he's in peak shape, can play defense. Like, he – He's a talented, particularly deep space defender, and uh, you know I, I don't think it's his it's his strength as a player. Like I think you want him out there running, oh, getting resets, uh, and just being generally very, very difficult to match up with. Um, but you know, actually, I don't know if I agree, Keith. I think Grant's more likely to play offense, and we're going to more, be more likely to see Jack Williams play defense. Uh, J- Jack to me is as versatile as it as the as any player on this list like obviously exceptionally talented on offense but just uh you know built his career as a d first guy and is explosive enough to get gigantic layout d's on people um it'll be interesting to see how they they map it out because you know free child also feels like a probably an offense first guy but another one who's played defense at you know, we can all remember the block saves the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's 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 also tricky because you know if if the U.S. is going to play to the level that a lot of people expect, there might not be a lot of o points. You That's know? a good point. Yeah, I mean that <laughs> that that may, be, that may be a lot of people playing a lot of defense. You know, uh, so 
we're going to see rotation. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, but you might be right about Jack coming out on defense. I mean, there are a lot of people who would say they think he's the best male matching player in the world. Probably a lot of hosts on the show would say that. Like a, <laughs> a, a vast majority of the hosts on the show would say that. So uh, I, you may see him kind of get a, a lot of different roles over the course yeah, of the Yeah, just want to get, get in points. Um, okay, let's take a look at, at the women's side. Um, and why don't we start with defense here as well? I mean, I think first and foremost, Claire Trope. Uh, you you got to start there. Claire Trope coming off of a defensive player of the year win in 2021 in the club division. Uh, you know, a, a, as with all these players, they're multi-talented. But I, what's so impressive to me about Claire Trope is her ability to play above the rim, quote unquote, <laughs> as someone who's not that tall. She's physical and able to go up and sky people who are, you know, six, eight inches taller than her and just has like a presence on the defensive side of the disc always seems to come up with the block. And I I think that, you know, while she's obviously capable on offense, like you really want to have her out there playing D probably not on a player like um, Mosqueda, but, uh, you know, taking either a, a fast fast either mid or deep cutter uh or you know you could even put her in like the wing in a zone uh if we're going to see some zone from them because she's got the ability to get up and make a play in the air uh just a one of the best defenders in the game right now it's like it's like she's in a mech suit so she just gets like extra extra size it's 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 unreal just someone who has preternatural timing uh ability to high point the disc and, and get great reads on it I, I also think you'll – it's funny that you started there, but I guess given the accolades, it, it makes sense. But uh, the first person my eyes go to for defense has got to be Opie Payne. Sure. Uh, you know, someone who's also a great puller uh, and is a tenacious defender. I, I expect to see a lot of Opie Payne on defense getting really tough matchups, although there's something to be said for giving her uh, maybe not the top matchups so that she can go out and get blocks maybe even more effectively. She's a tremendous block getter someone who's able to take risks on defense, calculated risks, uh, and that kind of ability, you know, that can be really effective if you're not in a position where it's like, oh, I need to be in complete shutdown mode on this player uh, because they're the biggest offensive threat. It can be helpful to have that person go down and get blocks if you have other people who can kind of do that shutdown role. And the the other player here, um, for me, Kayla Helton, uh, Mm -hmm. who has – become an even better defender in the last like two years than I think we've ever seen prior. And it obviously has played at an elite level for a long time. Um, she's been unbelievable so far in the Western ultimate league, just block after block after block. And uh, while I think, you know, certainly you could put her as a cutter on the offense and I'm sure that she'll get some reps in that spot. You know, she's going to be somebody who's going to be out there with Opie and uh, with, with Claire trope uh, on any kind of like, high leverage defensive point and uh you know is going to be able to bring that that size um and like like, like, (laughs) that really just is three of the best defensive players in the game right now plays plays very physical is is very strong and has great stamina uh so the kind of player that doesn't really wear down you know if if the team has to get into some gets into like a, a rock fight and ends up having to grind out points. Like Kale Helton's a, a great player to have on the line with you because she's just going to be able to outrun a lot of her opponents over the course of, the, of our game. And uh, it, uh, it's a one game a day tournament, so I don't expect the team to be super worn down. But you know, as other people pointed out, it's a fourteen person roster. You know, if you have an injury to somebody or whatnot, somebody's got to sit for a game. Uh, you know, that 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 can put a real strain on your rotation. Uh, and I can see Helton picking up some of that extra rotation. Uh, as, as it was on the mail matching side, I think trying to figure out what, what's going to happen on the fourth slot is both difficult and a fool's errand. I think you're going to see a lot of rotation. Uh, all of these players are quality defenders. Uh, I think that Carolyn Finney is like the closest thing to Mickle's like central offensive role, but we've seen Finney play a lot of D-line. There's, there's no shortage of, of examples of Finney playing D-line. I think that you want to get her in a high touch role, so you probably want her on most of your offensive points, but uh, I, I could easily see that role going to Claire Chastain as well. So I don't know exactly how they're going to deploy those two players. Uh, or, you know, Metroth and Normile are both very capable defenders, uh, great two-way players. 
I think you're probably likely to see Normile play a lot of offense where she can use some of the big throws that she has, big range on the on the forehand as well. Uh, so I think you'll probably see her get a lot of offense, but I, I, it's tough to say how they're going to utilize that fourth slot. And I think kind of leaving it as a flex slot, which is somewhat what we end up doing with the real matching players, is probably wise. Yeah, but it feels like pretty clear to me that we're going to see a lot of Mechstroth on offense, uh, a lot of Normile on offense, and a lot of Chastain on offense. Finney feels like the most flex player of that group. Um, obviously, Claire, I mean, any of these players can can play on either side, and, and I'm sure we'll see plenty of that. But again, like looking at the high leverage spots, right? When you have to put out your top O-line and you're looking for three uh, female matching players. I think you go, you probably go Claire, Carolyn, and Max. Uh, I guess it depends a little bit on what your handler cutter mix is uh, on the other side, on the, on the men's side. So uh, going to be very interesting. How do you feel like, Keith, this team's composition overall compares to the team from 2017? It feels like a really balanced roster. Uh, they, it feel, you know, we're we're having trouble deciding. You know, if you try and sit here and think about, okay, who are the seven that goes on if they have to hold to win the game? You know, and that, it's not exactly obvious because there's there's a, a a pretty balanced group here, and perhaps less specialization than we've seen in other years. Uh, certainly, there are players who have strengths and and are likely to to fit into the type type of roles that we've been talking about, but. I do feel like there's a little bit less specialization. I've heard some thoughts that maybe the team is undersized, uh, that you know they're 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 not necessarily in a situation where they're going to be a jump ball winning team. You know, we, we've seen other teams do that well, uh, and maybe this team doesn't quite have that. I'm a little less worried about that because I feel like they have a lot of players who play above their size, uh, trope, trope included, and, and maybe headlining that. But I think you could say that about a lot of players on this roster. Well. Uh, Let's let's look at the 2017 team really quick, just yeah. to refresh everybody's memory. Georgia Bosher, Claire Desmond, Carolyn Finney, Dylan Freechild, Serge Griffith, Leanne Hoffman, Sandy Jorgensen, Bo Kittredge, Chris Kotcher, Grant Lindsley, Jimmy Mickle, Anna Nazarov, Nick Stewart, and George Stubbs. Uh, so I think it's fair to say they had more like bigs in the traditional sense, right? They had Nick Stewart, Bo Kittredge, Sandy Jorgensen, Claire Desmond and this team, who would you describe as their bigs? Certainly Nate Goff. I, Goff, Goff Max, and Mextroth. Uh, maybe Kayla. And I guess Jimmy. I, I would probably lean more towards like Jack and Khalif. Like these are the types of players who I think play above their size. Yes. Yeah. So Jack, that's what Khalif, I was going to say. Their trope. A lot of athleticism, but less just, actual physical height. Um, now, I, I didn't necessarily love the composition of the 2017 team. I think they made some mistakes. I think that, you know, that was at a time when Jimmy Mickle wasn't really naturally like center handler type uh, in his game at that point. And I think that they struggled a little bit with not having cl- clear distributors in the backfield. Uh, because remember, some of the players they cut were Claire Chastain and Ashlyn Joy. Um, and, you know, even to some extent, Joel Schlockett and Nikki Spiva, right? These are players who are like primary distributors. I mean, Schlockett more, I guess, kind of like a mid, but sort of a handler. Uh, but they didn't have that like, you know, at the time, Claire was like the rock center handler. And Ashlyn Joy was the, you know, longtime center handler for Revolver. Neither of those players make the team. We questioned it at the time. And then I think it hurt them a little bit, especially early on in the tournament when they lose to Columbia. Uh, they just didn't look totally comfortable on offense. And I don't think this year's team is going to have that problem because I do think they have a good mix of off on the offensive side of the disc. They have a good mix of size and speed and throwing and a lot of versatility on that front. I think the question will be, is this team as strong defensively? Because like in our sub bonus last week, when we picked kind of like the, the alternate team USA, I do think we felt like the defense of our team maybe could outshine the defense of the actual Team USA. Um, And that will be the question for me. Like, does that size disadvantage that could be there, maybe, uh, have an impact when you're talking about players who have proven that they can still play 
exceptional defense, even if they're not, you know, six, five plus. Well, that, that's the thing is, I mean, it's hard to, from the pool of players that we have to build a team that can match up defensively with a team that has Sandy Jorgensen, Serge Griffith and Bo Kittredge. Like those are three of the greatest defenders in the history of ultimate. Like it's going to be hard to make a team that, that like can live up to that defensive reputation. Uh, I, I do think that also, if you think about it, the way that the game has evolved in the U.S., like th- I feel like we're playing a lot more small ball now than we were then. There's a lot more of give and go attack, uh, being able to throw into space and having this smaller, quicker, more skill based team may play into not only executing that offense, but also being effective defending what I think most people consider the top challenger, which is Columbia. They also run a very give and go heavy handler, handler disc movement, keep the disc in small windows. Like that is the style of play that we've often seen from Columbia be very successful. And having players that can match up with that is something that could be a boon for this team. You know, maybe trying to go bigger and better than Columbia isn't the move when you could be smaller and quicker and try and take away some of that attack and force them to slow down the game in a way that uh, we haven't seen people force that Columbia team to do. That's a great point, Keith. I mean, you think about the the team, you know, the, the kind of the model of high level ultimate at the you know the top levels of particularly the men's and women's divisions in 2016, 2017. You know, we're looking at big cutter, open space style action. So, like, you know, Bo and Sandy were the like preeminent players at this time, and it was lots of just like get the cutters out in space and let them, you know, win one on ones. Defenses are getting smarter. That's not as viable. We saw Pony, you know, wreck Revolver a couple seasons later, taking away that look and look at the kinds of offenses we've seen start to thrive. I mean, you're starting to see teams go dominator for entire points, not just in the red zone. And like, I kind of wonder, like, are we going to see some dominator heavy looks from this team USA? They certainly have the personnel to run it. That's that's what I'm saying. Like, and how the hell are you supposed to guard dominator with these players? Like, I think at the downside is probably just like the fatigue factor is a little higher on the people that you put in the backfield, but which of these players would be uncomfortable in that scenario? Not many. So I, I, I'm, I'm curious to see, like, do you think, do you think we're going to see vert stack? I think you're going to see a mix of looks. I think you'll probably see vert. I think you'll probably see some, some like side stack sets, uh, which help clear space to run some of the dominators. Uh, you know, I think that in a lot of cases, they're going to be able to out athlete a lot of teams and out outrange a lot of teams. So uh, you know, using that space will be effective, but I, I think you will see plenty of small ball from this team, especially near the red zone, but also to initiate play and free up power position opportunities to use that size and speed uh, that, that they may have in the downfield space. Well, it's certainly going to be interesting to see how it shakes out. I, I'm I'll, one, one final note for me, Charlie. I mean, I yep. feel like, I feel like on the previous iterations of the team, you know, they had, we kind of had a sense of who the vocal leaders were going to be on that team. And I'm curious who will be that player now. I mean, there are plenty of players with experience who are going to be on this team. You know, whether it's Mickle, whether it's Finney, uh, whether it's you know a new a player. Obviously, Claire Chastain hasn't been on this World Games team before, but has been there, done that at a lot of different stages. Same with Kayla Helton. Uh, so I'm curious who is going to emerge as kind of the vocal leaders, the captains, so to speak, of this team USA because uh, there are a lot of different candidates. And maybe they maybe they won't feel like they need to have a person in that role, but I feel like every team need, you know has leaders, and leading by committee can be challenging, especially for a new team. So I'll be curious to see how they handle that situation. Yeah, I mean, I figure it's generally going to fall to the players who played on the previous iteration. You know, like when George Stubbs and Bo Kittredge made the team uh, in 2017. I gotta say, I was so surprised. Like it's kind of like late career Bo at that point. But I think there was a sense that they needed to have that experience in the huddle. Um, And I don't think they took a player like that this time around. I don't think we saw them take a player who felt like maybe they were like kind of past their best years of competition, Um, which I think is smart. (laughs) I I didn't really like the bow pick back in 17. Um, So in, in that sense, like, you know, you do probably look to the players who were on that team who are still in the prime of their career to be that that leader type. But 
I agree that it's not an obvious situation. Like George Stubbs was like the captain of every team he ever played on. I jokingly call him Captain America. All right. <laughs> and and I don't think, you know, it's it's hard to say from, from the outside really who that's going to be now, but uh, it will happen. It will happen naturally. So we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk with John Randolph from Brown about their win at Easterns and more. Don't go anywhere. It's Deep Look. Joining us now on Deep Look is Brown Captain John Randolph, senior at Brown University. John, what's going on? Welcome back. Uh, Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So Brown coming off another tournament win, the rare sweep of warm up Smoky Mountain Invite and Easterns. Uh, what a uh, what a gauntlet to go through this season. Tell us a little bit about Easterns and coming away with the victory. Yeah, uh, Easterns was a was a good tournament. Our biggest test so far. Um, yeah, it, it, it's been a weird season. Uh, Florida was weird because, you know, two of the semifinal teams dropped out and some other teams weren't able to go to the tournament. So we went to that. We won that. And I was kind of like, OK, you know, don't get too excited yet. Uh, then we went to SMI and SMI was extremely windy. And I, I think we're a team that plays really well in the wind. And also we got very lucky to win that tournament. Um, got a couple upwind breaks on Universe that uh you know let us win and then finally we got a a tournament like easterns where everybody was kind of putting up some of their best punches um and so starting to finally feel feel fairly solid about the team uh yeah have you been surprised by how successful the team has been this season uh, you lost some pretty key pieces from the past couple of runs after the fall uh but the success has continued, if not grown, in 2022. Has that been a surprise for you at all? Yeah, it it has been a pretty big surprise. I was having a, a long conversation about this on the ride up from Eastern yesterday about how coming into this season, we have almost exactly half of our team is rookies. I think we have something like 11 returners and 12 rookies, and, uh, you know, freshmen and sophomores both because we we weren't able to play for a year like everybody and we we lost so many great players like Aziz and Saul uh, Hen- Henry Lasseter among others and we had a discussion at the beginning of the spring that was like we have all these rookies they didn't really get to play much in the fall should we even try and win this year or should we just try and develop and sort of keep the program alive for future years um, and we were like no, I, I think let's go for it. And I mean, it's I've been very surprised in a good way as as to how we've performed. We've had tons of guys stepping up, a lot of guys who are on our secondary D-line in the fall are now stepping up in the big roles on our first D-line and on our O-line. And then our rookies are also playing amazing. So it's been sweet. How how? You know, I know you run a fairly tight rotation from the games that I've watched, at least in in the big spots, uh, you know, in semis and finals and such, uh, particularly on the O-line. But how many of your rookies are getting regular run in the closer games, let's say, you know, against teams like Pittsburgh and Georgia and such? Uh, All of them. So we that's something we really, really try and do. Um, is get everybody at least a couple reps in the big games. Um, And we have a slightly smaller roster that allows us to do that. So we have, I think, 24 on the roster. Two of those guys are out for the season with long-term injuries. And then we had one or two more of those guys out for uh, short-term injuries this tournament. And so we don't have, like... Uh, you know, a towel squad of guys on the bench who are just there to like celebrate and and have fun. We we really do try and find a role for everybody and a specialized role for everybody. And so even if we have guys that haven't played before the season or aren't good at throwing or whatever, we we find a way 
to use what skill or what athleticism they do have and plug them into the system. Now, Brown, Brown's played a pretty diverse cast of challengers over the course of the spring. Uh, it, who's been the what's been the toughest game? Who's who's been the toughest team for you uh, during the course of twenty twenty two? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, we have played a lot of good teams that have challenged us. Um, I think at Smoky Mountain, the windy games made everything feel even harder. Um, so maybe it's just because of that, but I think the Colorado game in finals really, really felt like a challenge. And they, I mean, they probably should have won that game and they're a very, very good team. Uh, they they put a lot of pressure on our O line and played played pretty well on their O line. So I'll say Colorado. I I expressed skepticism that Brown could go and win Easterns, just given the way that we thought saw things break out at, at SMI and you know how tight some of the games had been. But frankly, it was probably your most convincing win. Yeah, I mean, you didn't have any one point games. You whooped Pittsburgh fifteen ten. Uh, you beat beat Georgia fifteen thirteen in the final. Uh, you know, obviously you didn't have to see UNC, so that maybe was a game that people were ch- chalking up for a, a, a finals uh, matchup between the two of you. Um, but did did it feel like that? Like you were in control the entire tournament? Uh, maybe it did for some of the other players on our team, but for me, no. It never feels like I'm in control in a game. It always even if we're up like 14, 10 about to score and about to win, there's a part of my brain that's like, well, we could still lose. We could still lose. This could happen and this can happen and we can drop the pole. And uh, so I, I would say, no, it never felt like we were in control. <laughs> I, I feel like I can see like, if I picture like you and, and Jock playing at the same time, like he always looks like he's like, yeah, we're going to win this game. And you always look like, I'm not going to let us lose this game. Uh, so I could definitely see that on the field. And and speaking of Jacques, I mean, he's had, he's had a great year and I, I imagine it's been a big part of the success that the, the team has had. What has it been like seeing him develop into the player that he's become, especially after maybe not getting to play together very much over the past couple of years? Yeah, it's it's been really incredible. We had, you know, he came in with a class of other really good sort of highly touted four and five star recruits two years ago as freshmen and they, you know, played like freshmen do like talented, but making a lot of mistakes. Then halfway through that season, obviously it got canceled and we went underwater for a long time. And, you know, obviously the pandemic sucked, but one thing that has been really cool is seeing who came out of it, the same player as before and who came out of it leveled up um, and who sort of put their head down and just put in work and work and work through those years. And and Jacques is one of those guys where he went in the pandemic, sort of a rookie who was very talented and came out of it stronger and faster and better throws and, and came out of it a winner basically. It's been something to watch the, the offense play. uh, And obviously I haven't seen tape from Easterns wasn't at Easterns this year, but you know, you, you all run a system that asks a lot of the top players on the O-line to make tough throws, get open in in one on one situations in like a dominator set, is that we've asked this question a couple of times on the show throughout the season? Is that a sustainable model at college nationals when the pressure is at its highest and games are at their most intense? Yeah, I I think it is. Um, I think one thing that we at Brown do and think a little differently is precisely around that. A lot of teams, I think, have more egalitarian systems and it's around, okay, we're going to teach everybody how to throw a flick huck and we're going to teach everybody how to make a deep cut. And so then we can set up this system where it's like anybody, if you catch an upline and there's someone going deeper, anybody in this scenario, we can all do the same thing. And the logic behind that is that um, if someone's not having a good game or someone's off, the other guys on the line can still do their roles and can step up. And our model is a little different in that we, I think, are more specialized. Um, And what this does is it means you get more reps doing your job. 
So for our guys who are more pure deep cutters, instead of having reps trying to teach them how to throw hucks that they might never throw in the finals of college nationals, they get twice the reps going deep. And for, you know, our guys that play zone, they're going to play zone and play zone and play zone and get really good at playing zone. And so I think it is sustainable for Jacques, for example, to get every dump, because if he gets every dump in the regular season, then he's going to have so many reps that by the time we get to nationals, um, it's not like we have six guys on the team who have each gotten one sixth of the O-line dumps. It's like Jacques has gotten so many reps that he can always get open. <laughs> he certainly he certainly gets open a lot. I don't, I don't know how how he does it, but he's got it, like you said, he just definitely seems stronger and faster, and that's that's helped. And uh, it's funny how much it reminds me of the growth that that Mac Hecht uh, went through, yeah. uh, also becoming stronger and faster as a thrower, uh, and, and how that helped this game. But uh, you, you you go into Eastern, so you get the win, and you take take on Georgia in the final, uh, kind of a resurging Georgia team that uh, obviously was also really strong in the fall. What what do you feel like made the difference in that game in the final and, and let y'all get that 15-13 win? Yeah, uh, I was really glad to play Georgia. I played them a bunch in my first couple of years at Brown and then hadn't got the chance to play them since the pandemic. And uh, they're fun. They play a little bit of a different system than a lot of the top teams we get to play, like Pitt and UNC. Um, and in particular, they have really good handler defense and they have some of the best defense against our Dominator set. Um, and so I was really glad that, you know, we got to take a shot at them. Um, let's see what made the difference in the final. Uh, it's, it's always hard to chalk that up to like one, you know, one factor. Cause there are a million different things. Um, but I, I think their O-line just made a few more mistakes than ours did. And particularly against our zone, I think. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, earlier, early in the game, they made a few mistakes that I think they would want back. And then by the end of the game, they had figured out their zone offense. And they were much more patient and they were basically able to uh, hold for the entirety of the second half. Um, so I, I think their, their first few mistakes against our zone in the first half was the difference. It's kind of wild that you come into the season you lose your opening game to Minnesota and then you've won everything since then. Take us all the way back to that Minnesota game. Was that just like a first game of the year type deal? Or did, do you think Minnesota is a team that like could give you trouble if you were to see them in nationals? Uh, I think that could give us trouble. I think they're a good team. Uh, and I think anytime you have Cole Jarek on the field, you know, there's, there's always a chance he's just going to take over and decide to win the game. Uh, I, I wouldn't put exactly so much stock in terms of straight wins and losses. I think, uh, in any, well, in most universe point games, if you played back the game 10 times, there's probably a 60% chance that the team that won would win and a 40% chance that the team who lost, uh, would win. And so I think that was one game where we, I think we're a little shaky, obviously first game of the season and and they outplayed us and they won. But in the same way that like, you know, I, I wouldn't go through the season and assign a binary to everything that's like, you know, we lost to Minnesota and we beat Colorado. It was It's like we, we lost to Minnesota and if we played that game a bunch of times in that same spot, in that same scenario, we would probably lose 60% of the time. And same with Colorado, if we played that same – uh, SMI final 10 times, we'd probably win six out of the 10 times. Um, so, so I do think Minnesota is a good team, but it's, I, I wouldn't assign everything to just wins and losses. So you, we, we, you see Minnesota, you see Colorado, North Carolina, Georgia, the Michigan, NC state, Texas, like all, all, all these different teams, a couple of, of West coast teams that you haven't had a chance to see, but, uh, another group that I feel like you basically haven't seen all year. In part, in part, you mentioned Florida warm up. Uh, some of the teams d- didn't continue through the tournament. Are the teams in the New England region, uh, which has notably been really strong this year, uh, but you haven't really gotten any reps against the teams that you'll be facing at regionals with a, a birth to nationals online, and and what certainly looks like it's going to be way too few bids for the number of quality teams that are going to be in the field 
how do you prepare for regionals against a bunch of teams you haven't really gotten very many reps against? Uh, it's going to be it's going to be hard. It's going to be a very difficult, crazy regionals. Um, yeah, I mean, you do what same thing you do for any tournament. Try and play your best. Try and watch the film and see where they have their weak points that you can squeeze. Uh, but I think at, at any point where it's going to be probably a regionals with six, five or six really good teams and maybe two, maybe three spots, uh, it's not just about knocking off one good team. We have to win a lot of games, and that means it has to be us playing well instead of us just defeating one team. So I think it's it's just about focusing on us at the end of the day. How how are you feeling about the the bid situation in New England? Uh, I'm feeling two things. First of all, I'm feeling nervous for us. I mean, you always feel nervous going into regionals. Anything can happen. But it seems especially scary this year for obvious reasons. And second of all, I'm feeling a little... I don't know what the, the right word is, but maybe a little sad because there are a lot of great teams in the Northeast and I have friends on all the different teams and friends who have worked throughout the years and through the pandemic and become, uh, you know, fourth years and fifth years and captains and led their teams. And these are a lot of the teams that have been around the bubble or just below the bubble. And finally now in a normal year would have like a really good shot to get to nationals and would deserve to get to nationals. And I think do deserve to get to nationals, but this year, a lot of them are going to end up on the sidelines through no fault of their own. Yeah, dude, and you just you just hope it's not you. You know, <laughs> you don't, you don't want to be the ones hanging out, uh, watching all these other good teams from your region go on. But uh, certainly, the 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 past performance of Brown doesn't doesn't make it look like that's uh that's in the cards. But you never know, you never know. Like you said, it's it's going to be a tough regionals. Um, I actually am hoping to be there, so maybe I'll be able to see it in person. But if not. Hopefully I'll be able to catch it uh, with my Ulti World subscription. So see, I'll catch you in the video. You like that? You like that, Charlie? A little plug in the interview? <laughs> I do like that. <laughs> UltiWorld.com slash subscribe. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm curious, who do you point to, John, as the X Factor players for you this season? Whether that's people who surprised you coming into the year or that, you know, have grown a lot as players who have just been key factors for your success so far this season Mm. interesting question um i think one guy who's really stepped up this year is leo gordon he came in as a freshman with shock uh very very athletic uh i remember when i was when he first came in as a freshman at some point in the fall uh we raced and it was like 100 meter or 70 meter, and he beat me. And I was like, damn. Uh, and uh, yeah, he, he was always a great thrower, very athletic, very talented on the field, uh, but he would turn it over a lot. And I think one of the, he's made great strides in the past few years in terms of his gamesmanship, in terms of picking his moments, realizing, uh, you know, what the right decisions are in terms of offense and defense, in terms of managing his legs and doing all the things that like aren't as noticeable maybe to somebody watching, um, but that are like the little things that really help you win a game. And then let's see, in terms of rookies, we have a lot of rookies I'd love to shout out who have been playing great. Uh, One I'm going to shout out though is Cam Kearney, who um, came in, who's been, struggling a little bit with some injury to his knee, a little bit of patellar tendonitis. Um, Wasn't sure if he was going to play at Easterns, but he came through and played at Easterns and absolutely destroyed some people. He's, uh, I saw some stat for the AUDL where somebody was tracking uh, bookends, like who got the most bookends. And in terms of our team and maybe in terms of the college division, Cam definitely has the most bookends where he would just go in and sneak in for a D and then go deep and, and go score. Um, yeah, he's he's just electric to watch. A big, big, big player. Uh, very curious to see how he's going to develop. I know y'all have given him some pretty tough matchups to kind of cut his teeth on and 
build up uh, the shutdown defender chops. And it sounds like it's it's really worked out in the way that he played at Easterns. Uh, I'm 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 very curious. You know, you mentioned that you had this kind of moment earlier in the year where it was you know, do we go for it? Do we do we take a step back? Do we focus on development? But let's let's go for it. So clearly, the goal here is is a, is another title. What do you have to do to get there from where you are now? What's what's missing from the team now that you have to add to be that championship winning team? Or, or could you go out and win today if you had to? Um, I hope we could go out and win today if we had to. That's that's a hard question to answer. I think if I had that answer, then then we could do those things and be sure that we were going to win. But the only thing, you know, only way to guarantee you win the championship is to win all the games. And that's never a guarantee. Um, So, yeah, we're just going to have to keep working, keep honing and refining our sets. And at the end of the day, you just got to just got to win. Who do you look at as the toughest competition, assuming you get to nationals? I know you got to get through regionals first, but assuming you get to nationals, who do you look at as the toughest teams that you'll have to face? Mm, that is a hard question. Uh, I mean, just based on this weekend, both Georgia and Pitt gave us really good games. Uh, I know the Pitt scoreline wasn't that close because they they made a bunch of mistakes on their O line. I think they wouldn't always make. Uh, but those are the the two teams who I felt like gave us the most defensive pressure um, this past weekend, uh, and then at SMI. Both UNC and um, Colorado, both very, very good, and and NC State was as well. So I don't know. The I name, guess the I names we would all teams. expect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, Who have been your toughest matchups this year individually, and I as a, on a player basis? That's a good question. Uh, matchups. Well, it's. It's kind of hard to say because I, I, I wish I, you know, could have a bunch of one-on-one reps with all the defenders and all the different teams so I could give a fair answer. <laughs> um, but I, but I, you know, I didn't play it at Flowo and I was a little um, hampered at SMIs, so I'll mostly go off Easterns. And I thought both the Pitt defenders and the Georgia defenders were quite good. Um, I think the Georgia defender was the best that I had seen this season, though. Gave me the most trouble. Um, I wish I knew their names. <laughs> they've, they've, they've got they've got some dogs, so to speak, uh, on on Georgia. And it, I, I'm I was a little surprised. You know, we, we saw that they didn't perform as well at SMI, uh, but I, I know y- y'all didn't get to see them. But were were you surprised to see them do this well after how they played it at, at Smoky Mountain Invite? Yeah, I was a little surprised just based on their SMI results. Um, someone was telling me that maybe they have a little bit more trouble in wind, which would explain SMI a little more. Uh, but I feel like the margins are very tight in this year's college game. Like there's so many close games, universe point games or two or three point games between all of the top 10 or so um, that it's not a huge aberration to miss the bracket in one tournament and make the finals in the next tournament. So I'm curious, you know, you just played college nationals a couple months ago in California and obviously Brown, very successful getting to the semifinals, uh, exciting game against UNC, both teams stacked. How do you think this Springs team compares to the, to the Brown team that played in December? It, it's a very different team. As I said before, we have 50% rookies. Uh, whereas in the fall, you know, we had a bunch of guys that had been on the team for like six years. Uh, and so this season we are pulling people into different spots, into new spots. We're trying different things and we're swapping people around really fast. And we're, you know, putting the wings on as we're flying the plane. Uh, whereas in the fall, you know, we had less time to prepare, but we knew what our line was going to be like, even over the pandemic. Um, so it's a, it's a little scary in this spring, but it's also very exhilarating. Are, awesome. Are some of these rookies, are, are some of these like pure rookies or are most of these players who've played ultimate in some form, uh, prior to coming to Brown? 
Uh, they most all played before. We do have a few pure rookies who are really stepping up. Is is it challenging to you know you run a a pretty like robust system? Uh, you have some players who've you know played in world championship games who've uh, you know won nationals, won college nationals, club nationals, or whatnot. And then you have other players who are brand new who maybe don't have a sense of like the history that's come before them for Brown or the expectations. You know, how do you bring all of that together when you have players in such different positions, but you're trying to win a championship. You're not just trying to, you know, make it to regionals or whatnot. You have lofty aspirations. How do you, how do you tie that all together? It, so I think for many of our players who come from having played at YCC or played in high school, they come into Brown and they sort of are ready uh, to, you know, they, they know what we're about and they're ready to be a part of the team culture um, and they're ready to kind of buy into whatever we give them. And then for the, for the last few spots of the guys who have not played before college, the number one thing we select for is competitive guys. Um, and, you know, obviously we want athletic guys and guys who figure out how to throw quickly. Um, but the when you get those last few guys who are just competitive animals and you get them at practice, they get bought into the team culture pretty quick. Well, it's going to be in a very exciting college series. And, uh, it, you know, it starts at regionals in New England. I mean, that's going to be the one to watch. Uh, I, I'm sure you're not going to give any bullets and board material out here, but who, who, which teams are you m- focusing most on preparation wise for regionals? Um, I would say the number one team we're preparing for is Brown. Uh, <laughs> I knew it. We're, we're, just, <laughs> we're just trying to make ourselves better. Although I'll, I'll give one shout out to McGill uh, cause we, we played them in the fall, uh, only if I'm remembering correctly, only their American players were allowed to fly in. So they had like nine guys at sectionals and they still gave us a pretty good game. They got a lot of talented players. I, I saw, I think their only tournament this year has been, uh, in Texas and they made the finals. Um, so I think they're going to put up a pretty big fight. Yeah. They're like the total wild card team coming in at the last moment to make it even more interesting. So uh yeah well, john thank you so much for uh stopping by and and best of luck to you and brown in the series thanks thanks for having me john randolph with us here on deep look we'll be right back welcome back to deep look Great to talk with John Randolph about all things Brown Ultimate. Keith, I have to say the most interesting answer for me that he gave to us was about their philosophical difference regarding how to prepare players for success. And do you think that that, the model that they're using, I'm curious for your perspective as a coach to hear what you think about it. And also, if you think it's, been part of the reason they've become such a successful college program these last few years. I, I I think the specialization is like a tried and true tactic in the sports playbook and something that a lot of ultimate coaches and players lean away from, you know, they want to be able to do everything. And I, I get that inclination because it's a sport where you never know what position you're going to be in. Sometimes you maybe the best deep cutter on the team, but you end up with a disc on the sideline. You got to throw a reset. Like I, you, sometimes you may be the best thrower on the team, but you got to play matchup defense. Like I, I get it. Uh, but specialization can be a great tool to allow players to have roles, even if they maybe don't have the overall strength that another player on the team might have, but to, for them to be able to be a strong contributor and to add something to your team, it's, it, it can be a way to maximize the resources that you have. You know, when we talk about teams getting being more than the sum of their parts, uh, this is a way to achieve that is by putting people in the right positions and letting them flourish there and benefit your team in the most, best way that they can. And so it's impressive to see that that's what Brown's done because we talk about how their team can look top heavy on paper, but they're getting production out of the rest of the out of the rest of the bench. The names that we don't talk about, the te- the players that you don't know uh, that weren't highly touted recruits, 
And that's clearly worked for Brown over the years. You know, if you ever wonder, oh, how did Mac and JR win a title together or whatever, if you think it's just those two guys, it wasn't. And this is part of that recipe. I I feel like it's so rare that we have a team sweep the big tournaments. Um, and what makes this even crazier is that among top programs, they have to be one of the most at risk of not making nationals. Right? Like, I guess mathematically, yeah. I mean, UNC should, reason that tough. <laughs> should be fine. Like, Georgia's way better than everybody else in the Southeast. Like, I think Brown is the best team in New England, but <laughs> I also think that it's really easy at regionals. If you get off to a bad start on Sunday, your season can go up in flames pretty quick. And there's just a lot of teams that are going to be coming for them. Now, you know, we'll see how it shakes out with the number of bids that they get. Maybe they get a third. That would certainly take some pressure off. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 I have to say, though, ultimately, I have just been wrong about this Brown team all year. I keep saying they're going to, you know, they're going to come back to earth. The, the offensive structure isn't going to keep working and it does keep working and it's continued to work. And they just won Easterns fairly comfortably and have not lost a game since game one of the year. So, we've, seen them, we've seen them do it in the wind. We've seen them do it not in the wind. We've seen them do it in Florida. Like they, I mean, they've so much versatility. And I think that they've gotten reps being the team with the target on their back. Yes. They've gotten reps in the pole position, and that's going to serve them well, both at regionals and at nationals. We got to talk about some of the other results here at uh, Easterns. Georgia taking down UNC in the semis. Are you surprised? Of course. <laughs> Who, how can you not be? Uh, I'm not shocked. I mean, this has been a year in which results have been fairly inconsistent, uh, uh, except for Brown, basically. Uh and there were plenty of surprises in this tournament to go with those. Uh, Georgia certainly seemed like they were playing much better than what we saw from Smoky Mountain Invite. I mean, they do drop uh, a game to Pittsburgh in pool play, but they trounced NC State in quarterfinals, so they were looking right uh, on Sunday. And then they, they beat North Carolina by three, by three. Uh, so Georgia is back in a big way, and I, I think we all can uh, – Remove our hands from the panic button. What? Where are we at with UNC right now? Panic button. Pan, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they've they've only lost three games. They lost that game to UMass in pool play at Smoky Mountain. Then they lose to Brown 15-13 in semis. Uh, they lose to B- Georgia 15-12 uh, in semis at Easterns. I, I just don't. There's no way around it. They're not the favorite anymore, Keith. I think Brown has firmly taken the mantle going into nationals as the favorite. And I, I guess, you know, I, I'm waiting to take a look at the tape from Easterns, but I, I do I do think that the significant turnover they had on their O-line, particularly from 2021 to now, is like been a problem. It's been a little bit of a problem. And it, obviously it's only flaring up against the very best teams but uh they they, with with lsb back at full strength this weekend i really thought that we were going to see unc you know kind of prove that they were the top dog and and that that's not happened the weaponry is just not of the same caliber as what we've seen in past years They, they just don't have the same level of firepower now they have a ton of resources and excellent coaching staff I'm pretty confident they're going to still be you know, in the mix at nationals. And one of the reasons that is, is that they don't play a lot of close games. You know, they, most of the games that they win, they win pretty comfortably. And I, that's a great sign to me of a team that, that knows how to win. Uh, yeah. They've taken some losses to pretty good teams, but I, I agree with you is the, the Brown is in the driver's seat right now. All right. They're holding the belt, but this UNC team, I still has to be considered a big threat, and I think that I think that they're taking a step back from where they were last year. But where they were last year was so far and away ahead of most teams that, like, sure. they could take a step back and still win the title. Yeah, I just wonder if they have a, enough star power. You know, they don't have the same top end 
top three to four players that I think Brown has to be, to be honest. Uh, not that they're a weak team at all. I mean, they're probably the deepest team in the country. Like Brown, Brown doesn't have a lot of depth. Like we just heard JR talk about the fact that they have half rookies and I don't care how specialized you want to make your rookies. When it comes down to the gauntlet at nationals, you're not going to want to have those guys in high leverage spots. Sorry. So UNC has a big advantage there, but I do think that, you know, Brown can stack an O-line and go out and feel extremely confident that they're going to score the disc. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to see where UNC goes from here because, uh, you know, I, th- I think that they're used to being pretty dominant and this is uh, it's crazy to think that a three loss season where your losses are like basically the only other top five teams uh, is like a disappointment, but that's, that's the standard they've set. So uh, very curious to see where they'll go. Uh, I now count Smoky Mountain as largely an aberration for Georgia. Uh, they're about where I thought they would be, which is just a step below the tip top teams. Uh, I think getting a win against UNC is a, is a big achievement for them. Uh, I think they need to hope that it's not windy at nationals. And the thing is, like, I don't think that this is some um, that that what we saw at SMI is is emblematic of this team. Uh, I, I think the evidence has all pointed to this being a semis quality team at the national championships, aside from that one poor weekend. And they got their bell rung and they bounced back in a big way. Absolutely. And this is kind of what they had to do to disprove the disprove the haters. You don't want to build the narrative. You don't want to make it a trend. Uh, you got to prove but, it to yourselves too after right. getting thumped and like that. It sounded like they were a little rudderless, so they lost a little bit of their identity. And this sounded like they got it back. You know, we're going to be a team that goes out there and we dog you on defense. We're going to chase you around. We're going to grind you down. Uh, use our depth. Use our athleticism. Fly around, and we can we can outplay teams if they try and play our style. And so it's it's good that they have that in the pocket now because I think that's what they need to move forward as a championship contender. Now the, the rest of this field, you know, is there anybody who stands, you know, the Cal Poly slow, I think is the story that a lot of people have been talking about. They go one and three in pool C on Saturday, uh, miss the bracket, tough, tough scene for, uh, for slow traveling all the way from California, especially because uh, the other California team, Cal also did not make the bracket. So tough yeah, weekend and, for the Southwest and, and UCLA had a horrible weekend up at uh Northwest challenge. Yikes. So I, I don't really know what to make of that. I mean, we've seen Cal look good and we've seen UCLA look good against out of region competition. Uh, certainly Cal poly slow has been, been very, very impressive, but I, I think it's, it, it, I think it's admittedly difficult. I mean, I'm trying to remember back the year that Cal poly made semis. Did they go to Easterns? I want to say they did. And they were like a little banged up and they didn't have a very good tournament. And then they went and made the semis at nationals. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen this time around. I don't think this team is as talented as that one. We can look up the results of uh, 2019 Easterns. But I, I do think it's a little bit concerning. I don't think you want to overly read into it. But uh, mostly I just think that the teams that they're going up against, it was, it was very, a stacked field. So you're not, you're not going to call them the South worst now. (laughs) No, not, not yet, (laughs) but I'm, I'm, I want to look at their full schedule. So they drop games to Northeastern Carleton and NC state. Uh, it's not inspiring. I will say that. Like, I feel like you got to win at least one of those games. Absolutely. Uh, I, I I will go out and say it's disappointing. You know, it is, it's concerning to me. Yeah. Sure that, you know, they, they were flying West Coast, East Coast or whatnot, but uh, I expect more from them. And, you know, they're, they're going to be doing a time zone change for nationals. Uh, we know that their region is also probably going to be tough uh, in like, it'll be a challenging regionals, but this is a team I, I felt like looked like a you know, outside shot national final team or whatnot and uh that feels a little further away after yeah this weekend. well how do you feel about how do you feel about Pitt's results they, they get the they get the win over georgia to start the weekend which looks real nice in in retrospect sure does. this this is this is much better <laughs> from where we started the year i think and not just you know but we're talking to, to to john randolph and he's he's 
spoke about Pitt being one of their toughest matchups, and they beat them 15-10. I mean, I, I think that the score maybe not reflective of the quality of play Pitt has. I'm still a little worried about their depth offensively. Yeah, uh, definitely. But I, I feel like they, they could end up being a bit dependent on Henry Ng. Uh, but I I think that this team is, is showing some grit. They have some good results here. Uh, like you said, that win over Georgia is good. They beat Cal. They pounded Carlton. So those are good. And they lost close to UNC in, in consolation play. Uh, Pitt looks looks like they're in a much better place. I know we were all worried after Nationals last year. You know, warm up. They had some some mixed results. So uh, I think this is a, is a much better looking version of Pitt right now. And, and they're bouncing back. I mean, I think the big story for me, and you know, I'll, I'll wait to really say this with a lot of confidence until I actually see the tape from Easterns, but Brown's O-line is just incredibly difficult to break. And I think that's why you see a lopsided score against Brown uh, for Pittsburgh relative to the other games, because I think Pitt scores a lot of its points with breaks from their D-line. And their defense is really the standout line. But the problem is, and we saw this even at uh, warm-up, Without Randolph in the lineup, they could not get breaks. They could not get breaks. And same story here. Pittsburgh has a couple issues scoring the disc on offense. And all of a sudden, you have a game that's, uh, you know, looks kind of like a blowout. Uh, now, that's not to say they didn't apply good pressure in that game, but that just goes to show you the quality that we've seen from Brown's O line and their ability to just continue to run through their top guys and have Nissen be that key distributor who continues to get open and continues to make the key throws. Uh, it's uh, it's really, really hard to match up with their with their top three or four guys. Any other thoughts on, uh, on Easterns? Well, I mean, I feel like we saw some resurgent teams this weekend as well. Like NC State, kind of a bounce back, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably one of the key things that, that I see. Uh, Maryland showing up, playing pretty well. They were they like weren't even supposed to go to the tournament, right? They they did they end up finishing fifth. That's pretty amazing. I feel like they were a late late inclusion. So this Maryland team all over the place. I mean, they got they got smacked by UNC and they lost pretty handily to Brown, but a win over Tufts, a win over Texas, a win over Carlton, and what looks like might have been a forfeit loss uh, or forfeit win that is against NC State. That's just listed as a uh, win loss. So uh, either way, I mean, a great weekend for them. I think Carlton showed some growth here in their results. Uh, Wisconsin goes zero and four. Keith in pool play. So, I, I'm I'm not ready to write them off. No, uh, you I don't mean, write them worried, off. But first, first time, first time outside, probably. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, extenuating circumstances, obviously, for their season, but it it doesn't inspire confidence. They had a tough pool, admittedly, but um, and then Temple got a win. Keith, <laughs> Temple Shout did get Temple. a win. Nate, Nate, Little, Nate Little's out here uh, crushing fools, so uh, I'm, I'm here for that. Yeah, so they, they go one and five, um, and they beat Virginia Tech, uh, who went winless. So good for them. Um, but that's yeah, that's it. I mean, I think uh, the, the final takeaways, and we're going to talk more about this in our subscriber bonus segment where we kind of look at the college season overall and do a little bit of a recap of top teams, surprising teams, top players top rookies uh, is things are a little more bunched up than we may have expected coming into the year. And we'll have to talk about whether we think Brown has separated more uh, in the men's division than we expected, or if the rest of the teams are maybe a little lower than we might've expected them to be coming off of the fall college nationals. Same story in some ways on the, on the other side, in the women's division, where UNC is the best team, but are they the best team to the magnitude that we expected? So we will discuss that in our subscriber-only bonus segment. All right, we've got a little small ball segment. We haven't done this in a while, so let's bring it back. Keith, let's play some small ball. Been a, been a while. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to be back. First piece of news, uh, obviously, we've got the uh, conference championships coming up this weekend. A little bit of uh, social media buzz about what's going on with B teams. Now, the, this issue does not seem fully settled at this point, but it seems that 
communication with developmental teams, aka B teams, et cetera, C teams, um, was a little late. And we had some B teams signing up for the standard conference championship, you know, the the normal D1 or D3 conference championship that they were ha- had gone to last fall or maybe in, in 2019. Uh, but USA Ultimate deciding that most of those teams going to play in dev conferences, developmental conferences, separate from the main D1 and D3 ones. And uh, so now some teams are really frustrated because they're finding this out so late that either the distance is too far or they don't have approval from their school or there's other some other logistical challenge uh, to be able to go to that event. And we have yet to hear anything back from USA Ultimate. We reached out to uh, ask for comment uh, on Monday morning and have yet to hear back. So uh, we'll keep posted there. But but Keith, uh, this seems like a kind of just a, a frustrating missed connection between USAU and these B teams, uh, which are you know obviously teams that are that are not of, often being sort of the focus of uh, the primary resources from. USAU and, and, you know, multi world, et cetera. And, and are often populated by new players. So it's, it's a bit frustrating to me that USC ultimate is, is not finding some way to make this work, especially when it feels like it was a communication error, which generally is their responsibility. So I'm, I'm curious to see if there's going to be some, some walking back on the part of USC Ultimate trying to find a way to make things work because, like you mentioned, the, the issue doesn't feel quite settled yet. But uh, right now, it's not looking good. I mean, there are conferences starting this weekend, and there are teams that you know I, I can speak for for my team, which is not a developmental team, but we have to make arrangements with the school for travel well ahead of time. So teams are being like, talking about being moved to different tournaments that are in different locations, different dates. Like it's hard to make last minute plans with your school and still get approval for it. So I, I hope that this is getting figured out because the timeline's pretty tight and you hate to see new players, new leaders on teams. You know, a lot of these are not going to be the the same people that have been handling club organization for a while after the pandemic. Like we've, we've talked to all the potential growth issues that already exist coming out of the pandemic for some of these smaller schools, smaller teams. So uh, I, I, I hate to hear this kind of stuff's going on. What's next, Keith? So uh, next up, we have the AUDL with a surprising announcement, uh, at least for me, uh, which is that they are going to be at TEP uh, in Columbia for some showcase games. Uh, we have yet to see this happen before, but they will travel travel down and be playing along with the Premier Ultimate League, who will also be playing uh, at, at TEP for, for some showcase games. So, uh, there will be some semi-pro ultimate uh, from the states on display uh, at TEP, which should be a lot of fun, as well as some uh, some World Games scrimmaging uh, with the Columbia World Games team playing against All Stars that I imagine will be composed of uh, of of some of the AUDL and MPUL players. Yeah, that's what it's listed on the uh, schedule. That it'll be a USA-based All Star players competing against uh, Team Columbia on Friday, April fifteenth. Uh, Revolution will play Milwaukee. That's an actual PUL game, like on the schedule, not just regular like season a, matchup. Okay, the regular season matchup. Uh, Revolution's only home game, um, and then and that's on uh, April fourteenth, Thursday night. On Saturday night, there will be two AUDL showcase games. Uh, the Los Angeles Aviators taking on the Latin American All Stars, and then the New York Empire playing the DC Breeze. Those are just preseason games. Those are not a uh, part of the AUDL season. Uh, so kind of cool to see this. I mean, T- TEP has become a real hub of competitive America's ultimate, right? Both South, Central, and Northern America uh, coming together. And and we, we've, for a long time, we've seen like American club players, US club players going down to play at TEP, uh, either on just like a, like a, a mixed team or with with kind of like a loose co- conglomeration of their typical club team. Uh, but increasingly, we've seen, you know, obviously the PUL game from a couple of years ago before the pandemic. Uh, a great game, by the way, that Revo game. And uh, now we'll get that plus these AUDL games. And it looks like the AUDL is going to be trying to really make some inroads into Latin America. 
Um, they've announced this new Sky AUDL initiative, trying to, cult- as they put it, cultivate a working relationship with the already thriving Ultimate communities in Latin America. And uh, they have a program ambassador named in uh, Jock Jimenez. So uh, he played with uh, the Aviators back in 2019 and is going to help uh, try to, to grow the game there. So interesting initiative from the AUDL. More more uh, semi pro news. Uh, we'll go to the Western Ultimate League. They they've had a, a couple of weeks of action here, but uh, some uh, probably what you would call upsets coming this this past week. Uh, Oregon at home uh, for their first home game, I believe, uh, beats Arizona eighteen fourteen without without Alex Steinfeld, who's been like one of their their most important players. Uh, and then the San Diego Super Bloom also at home uh, taking down San Francisco fifteen fourteen in a close one. So Oregon now second in the standings. Seattle still at the top at, at undefeated. Uh, Oregon moves uh, to the second spot at two and one. And San Francisco second to last, one and three. We said when we talked about them last after the opening weekend that they were in a bind. Uh, they probably have to win out, and even then, that may not guarantee them a, a postseason spot at this point. Yeah, it's it's you know you absolutely have to go at least three and three. And so if you're already sitting on three losses, it's it's going to be a little tricky. Uh, and, you know, you really need some help at this point. So I think it's probably unlikely that they make the playoffs at this point. Uh, big win for Oregon, for sure, this weekend. And uh, continuing interesting action. We've got two big uh, conglomeration weekends coming up with San Diego hosting uh, uh, four games in two weeks and then Salt Lake hosting four games uh, the weekend after that. So we'll have a lot more stuff s- starting to f- settle into the playoff picture after those two uh, events. Uh, and then meanwhile, Keith, the premier ultimate league started its season this weekend. Mm-hmm. We had two games on the calendar, Milwaukee taking on Columbus, Raleigh taking on Atlanta and uh, the favorites won both games, but they couldn't have been more different. Uh, Milwaukee planned pretty tight with Columbus early in the game ends up getting the win and Raleigh just absolutely trounces Atlanta who I guess was missing some veterans this weekend uh and and Raleigh just blew the doors off them um that I don't know that we've seen that game film yet because the game was not streamed um the uh, Milwaukee Columbus game was streamed although the the stream was kind of uh bare bones with just like a essentially a feed of the game with no audio uh, and then occasional score updates from the PA announcer in the stadium we, we certainly uh, know what it's like to have to make it work with wh- whatever you got. So I'm, I'm glad that there is footage out there. I think that the standard that the Western Ultimate League has set this year and that the Premier Ultimate League has, has set in previous years is above where they were. And I think that disappointed some fans who were excited to be able to you know make a, make a big show of, of the opening weekend of the league. So it, certainly it's, it's disappointing to see, but uh, I, I can understand and, and have been in that position before. It's a difficult thing to put together a you know, really strong live stream production. Uh, it, it not only difficult, also expensive. <laughs> so uh, yeah. definitely challenges on, on that front. But I, I'm hoping that, that that's something that we'll see uh, evolve over the course of the year because we've certainly seen the Premier Ultimate League deliver on that front in previous season in their previous season. So uh, that's that's something that I hope gets shored up. And whoa, that that rally result like. I don't know if Atlanta's not good or Raleigh's really good or both or that version of Atlanta, you know, the very new team, a lot of new players who yeah. haven't played in the league before, who haven't even played a ton of like elite level club before. Uh, and that is a rude introduction. Uh, 28, to 28, 13 leagues. final. Yeah. I, I, is that the, is that, that might be the biggest margin in league history. It's not a long history, but that it's got, I, be I, I have there. trouble thinking of a bigger blow up than that. That's uh, uh it's a beat down for sure. Uh, but you know, I think it's, the best team in the league in the radiance playing arguably the bottom team in the league. And, you know, we see, we see score results like that in semi pro ultimate when you have the big disparity, when you have the number one, number two team playing the the bottom team in the league. So, you know, we'll see what happens with Atlanta. You can only really go up from here. Uh, in the other game, uh, Milwaukee wins 1915. So strong second half for the monarchs. What? And, uh, we sh- we should know because uh, I I know this is something people were were, t- were talking about after the Monarchs game as well. The Monarchs uh, conceding the first hold opportunity that they had, uh, giving up the score uh, as part of an apology 
uh, for some of the, the stuff related to sexual assault that was going on with the team earlier in the year. If, if, if you caught our earlier episodes or, or read that story about that, uh, the team, you know, really saying, Hey, we think that it is more important to honor these people than it is to, you know, have on field success, which I, I think is a big statement. I'm going to disagree slightly. You know, I, I, I get the concept here. Uh, reportedly, this was at the request of the victim involved in, in this situation. So in that sense, you know, good on them for doing that. It doesn't really feel like a way of actually solving the issue meaningfully. Like in my mind, uh, it's, I guess it's symbolic, but I think you have to do a lot more than drop the pull to kind of like work on an issue like that. Um, especially when you're playing a team that you're probably going to beat. So, it, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know that there, I don't know that anybody's claiming like, Oh, well th- we're good now. Right. Like this whole, this whole thing's over. Like, I, I don't think that's the, what they're trying to yeah. for. I don't know. It just, it just feels like a little bit of a, a strange way of approaching the, the, the situation like a statement before the game would make more sense to me. Like, I mean, on the other hand, we're here talking about it <laughs> because it was like a surprising thing to have happen at the beginning of a game. Um, anyway, let us know your thoughts at deep look pod, deep look at ultiworld.com coming up this weekend in the PUL. We've got the Indianapolis red heading to Nashville to take on the nightshade and the Raleigh radiance going up to DC playing the shadow. That should be, a good early season matchup. Uh, and then we'll get ready for the uh, Revo Milwaukee game. That's going to be a key game in two weeks uh, with Portland taking on Austin and the gridlock taking on the shadow. So we're getting going in this PUL season and Hey, ultimates ultimates up and running Keith. Oh, that's for sure. It's uh, it's been took us a long time to get here, but uh, now there's like uh, an overflow. It's like, there's so much to do on the weekend. That is going to do it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Appreciate you listening. Please like and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. And uh, give us a listen over in our subscriber bonus segment where we talk about the college season that we've seen so far and get you ready for the postseason, which begins this weekend. Good luck to all the college players competing. For Keith Rayner, I'm Charlie Eisenhut saying so long, and we'll talk to you next week right here on Deep Look. Deep Look.